Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh, and there's Chuck, and there's Jerry over there. So let's get to it while we're talking about mangroves, everybody. Mangroves, gather around while we talk about mangroves. My new favorite tree. It's a great tree. It's a good favorite tree to have. It is, and uh, this is one of those, I think this is the second and probably final that was inspired by my recent trip to Mexico because uh, <laughs> we were surrounded by mangroves, literally surrounded by mangroves, and we couldn't get enough of them, man, like mm-hmm. riding the bikes around and looking in these mangrove forests mm-hmm. and considering what it must be like to try and navigate through them. Uh, nearly impossible, I would say. Uh, cause yeah, I mean, you've seen them in person, I'm sure like just mm-hmm. how dense these things are. Uh, and you know, we're gonna be talking about different kinds, but really sort of the money mangroves sure. are the ones that we're going to focus on. And they are just, I was knocked out just by how they looked and I could tell that they were a remarkable wonder of nature and evolution. And then after this stuff, uh, Dave Ruse helped us put this together after learning, everything that they're capable of, mm-hmm. it's just like, what What kind of tree is this? It's amazing. It's an amazing tree. Like I said, it's maybe one of the best trees to have as your favorite tree because there are very few trees that are this amazing, Chuck. Man. And we're talking mangroves, and we should say mangroves aren't necessarily like a species or even a family of tree. One of the other things that makes them such a cool tree to have as a favorite is that there's something like 80 or 90 species of them, and they're not genetically related in every case. Instead, biologists classify them by their ability to survive and even thrive in salty water, that uh, in soil that has little to no oxygen, which are two things that most trees can't do. And that's just the tip of the iceberg in what makes um, mangroves so amazing. Yeah, but like I said, we're talking mainly about those amazing trees that sit up above the water Mm -hmm. with this network of, uh, you know, look like fingers just sort of propping up the tree, which are the roots. Um, They are a a woodland tree, uh, also could be called a shrub. And they grow in a pretty narrow area uh, between, um, well, they're subtropical along the coastlines, first of all. But they grow between, literally between um, the terrestrial and the marine environment in salty, brackish water. Yeah. Um, And there's, I want to say a lot of them. It's really not, though. I think they make up like 1% of the forests of the world, mangrove forests are. But it's still 85,000 square miles, which is a pretty decent amount of area uh, for, you know, one kind of tree. It's about the size of the state of Arkansas. Um, And the largest mangrove forest in the world is at the mouth of the Ganges um, near the Bay of Bengal. It's called the Sundarbans. And that's where the Bengal tiger lives, which is pretty cool. Agreed. Uh, they exist in 118 countries, mm-hmm. and here in the United States, in Texas, Louisiana, and Florida, and I thought, oh, surely the Georgia coast, so close to Florida, nope. surely they've got some mangroves. Don't even try. Not quite. They, they, I did see some people that were like, oh, so mangroves, um, but it's not true. It looks like the closest mangroves are about 40 miles from the Georgia border near the Georgia coastline. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was really sad that we don't have our, our mangroves. That um, is sad. But they do have them in Florida and Louisiana and Texas and in Mexico. <laughs> That's right. And again, you said that they grow subtropically. And Chuck, I want to share that it was just today that I finally stopped and was like, what, this subtropical thing is driving me crazy. <laughs> the, like, it's it's above the tropics on either uh-huh. side. It's either above or below, depending on where your perspective is. But it's not below it's not below the equator. And then I realized if you're on the equator from the perspective of the equator, it's <laughs> below the equator on either side. So it's subtropical. Oh, uh, you've never uh, stood on the equator. I never have. And so I think I should. You can't be to blame. <laughs> I've never been to Ecuador. Well, we should go sometime. We should do a podcast live, live from the uh, equator. Yeah, and see if we melt. I know I will. Yeah, I would too. I'm melting this week. Um, as far as man- the money mangroves that I was talking about, we're talking about <laughs> red, black, and white. Mm-hmm. And for my money, uh, I love those red mangroves. Those are the sure. ones 
that grow along the water's edge. Uh, they have those prop roots that, and if you've never seen a mangrove, uh, mangrove, please just look up red mangrove. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they're called prop roots because they prop that tree up off the ground. They are fully, well, not fully exposed because they also go into the water and into the soil, but mm-hmm. uh, they are largely exposed and they are just tangled, gnarly, beautiful roots that, again, uh, I can't imagine trying to navigate through a mangrove forest. You probably had to go around. Yeah, it can be really, really thick, um, both ab- above water and below water because of those roots. So those roots, um, if you see them, that means that it's low tide. At high tide, they're usually covered up with water. But it's like you said, they prop the tree up. And so for that reason, because at low tide, you can see the bottom of the tree and it's above ground. Um, they're sometimes called walking trees. But they're pretty neat. And the red mangrove is, I think, anyone who knows about mangroves or has seen a mangrove probably is what they're thinking of as a red mangrove because there's just those those roots are just so characteristic and unusual, you know? Yeah, the black mangroves are still really cool looking uh, because they have these um, protrusions coming up out of the water uh, called pneumatophores. And just, you know, put a pin in this. They But they allow the plant to basically breathe. And we'll talk about that later. But if, if you look at a picture of these, it looks sort of like almost like little just spiky roots sticking up out of the ground all around the tree. Yeah. Almost like stalagmites. Yeah. Um, and I got that right too, by the way. That's right. Um, white mangroves are, it's weird. I, I don't understand fully why they're considered mangroves aside from the fact that they must still thrive in brackish or salty water and poor, um, poor oxygen soil. That's it. But I guess so, but they grow inland and they have normal shallow root systems like any other terrestrial tree, but they're still considered mangroves. Yeah, and I don't think I mentioned the black mangroves do grow a little bit further inland than the reds. Yeah, so if you are, you know, looking at a cross section of the ocean hitting the land and going inland, you would see at the ocean or at the the bay or wherever, um, red mangroves on the shoreline actually growing into the ocean, depending on where the tide is. Behind them, you would have the black mangroves on slightly higher ground. And then behind those, on the highest ground, you would have the white mangroves. And that's what it would look like. You put it all together. What you have is a mangrove forest, also known as a mangal. A mangal, which is... Uh one of the mo- more amazing, we're going to be talking about a lot of amazing things about mangroves and mangals, but th- it's the only species of tree that can grow in salt water. Um, mm-hmm. And big time, they grow, it's not like they love the salt. We'll see in a minute. They have a, some great ways of getting rid of it, um, but they figured all that stuff out. But they can grow in salinity levels of 75 parts per thousand, which is about twice as salty as ocean water. Yeah. That's pretty impressive because, I mean, where are they growing that, that's twice as salty as ocean water, you know? I think that's just kind of showing off at that point. <laughs> well, I didn't know if, like, that inland water, like, just accumulates salt or something. Yeah, I, th- I would. Th- yeah, Maybe? you might be right. Yeah, yeah, I think you've hit upon it. Okay, so they're not show-offs. They're just doing what they've <laughs> got to do. They're, I mean, that's they're a guess. Making, they're making lemonade out of the lemons that, that they were handed by natural selection mm-hmm. for where they grow. So what about the salt? How do they get rid of it? So you would think like they just they can drink salt water and use it like, you know, terrestrial trees use water. Not true. There's actually two techniques where they can either um, keep salt from entering their roots or they can take the salt in and then get rid of it in certain ways. And so that means that there's two types, secretors and non-secretors. And black mangroves are secretors, I believe, right? That's right. Uh, Those are the ones with the little nubby, they look like sticks almost, sticking out of the water. Mm -hmm. Uh, They filter it out and they secrete it on the leaves. So that means if you see a black mangrove and you see some, you know, kind of chalky white stuff on the leaf, that is salt. Like go, I don't know if I should say go lick it because... I don't know if that's dangerous at all, but (laughs) it's it's salty. Just trust me. It tastes like salt and DDT. (laughs) Gosh. Um, red mangroves, they're, uh, they're non-secretors. So they actually just don't allow salt to be taken up by their roots. Now, that's easier said than done because their roots are planted in the water, right? Mm-hmm. So there's water. They're taking up water from the ocean, from salt water. And what they do is they have cell walls that actually act 
um, through re reverse osmosis. It lets water through, but it doesn't let solids through, which is quite a trick. I mean, that's something that humans have only recently figured out how to do. The mangroves have been doing it for who knows how many hundreds of thousands or millions of years. Um, but they do it in part because they have this hydrophobic, lipophilic material called suberin that really serves them well. That's right. It allows them to get rid of more than 90% of the salts in the water, mm -hmm. uh, which also means, which I didn't really think about until just now, that they can they can literally tolerate, I guess, about 10% salt content. Yeah, I saw 90 to 95%. But yeah, that's still a lot of salt for a plant. Totally. Yeah. So they have at least adapted in some ways to, to tolerate salt more than other plants. But for the most part, they're just really good at... Um, keeping salt from being taken up by their roots. I just find that fascinating. Uh, and I love how Dave puts these. Uh, he he <laughs> His sections are labeled either mangrove magic tricks mm -hmm. or uh, what was the other one? Mangrove superpowers. <laughs> yeah. <And laughs> Which is pretty fun. They're both apt. They are. Uh, so this is magic trick number two is we mentioned, you know, I mentioned earlier that they actually breathe through these roots. Um, I think typically you might, like to think about plants as, uh, you know, just eating up that CO2, mm -hmm. which they definitely do. But plants need oxygen, and they need to get oxygen from the roots. And, and you know, with a regular tree and a regular forest, they're getting that, like, through the soil and these mm -hmm. little gaps between the soil. Uh, in mangrove or mangals, I guess you would say, they can't do that because the tidal sediments come in and it's all waterlogged and compacted. So they don't have those air gaps that you have in a normal forest. So they kind of came up with a brilliant little trick to get around that, right? Yeah. So the pneumatophores that black mangroves have, those stalagmites um, that are coming up in, in spikes around them, those act as snorkels. So they stick up out of the water and they're covered in these little cells called lenisols, and that's where oxygen exchange happens. So they actually absorb oxygen through these snorkels. They get taken into the snorkel, underground into the other roots of the tree, um, and used for um, aerobic respiration, which is converting food into energy, which is pretty nuts. And pneumatophore actually is Greek for air carrier, so. Makes sense. Pretty on the nose. Yeah, some of those pneumatophores can reach up to 10 feet tall. Did you see that? Yeah, I, I didn't. Um, I looked at a lot of pictures. I didn't see any that tall with my eyeballs, but mm -hmm. I looked because I wanted to see that. Yeah, I didn't see it either. Could be made up. Uh, so then you've got this. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> um, then you've got these red mangroves that we talked about. For my money, like the money mangrove. And those prop roots uh, serve the same purpose as the pneumatophores. They... You know, like I said, they sit up on those long um, sort of curvy stilts mm -hmm. and they stay above water like a lot of it stays above water, even at high tide uh, at times. And they are also covered with those linosols and they do the same thing. They allow for that oxygen exchange to take place. Yeah, so that explains also why there's so many roots and so many pneumatophores that, that spread around these trees. It's like if you dug up a, a tree of roughly the same size, it would probably have a similar sized root structure, maybe a little less, but you don't see it. It's all underground. This is above ground, so it like looks like a lot of roots, and it is a lot of roots, but it's not necessarily more than a terrestrial tree would have. We just don't see them. Yeah, it's like a tree that is dropped trowel. <laughs> it is. It's exactly right. It's porky pig in it. Should we uh, should we take a break at yeah. uh, mangrove magic trick number two? Leading uh, yeah, into number we'll three. Back, yeah, we'll come back with number three right after this. <laughs> So, Chuck, which mangrove is your favorite kind? Well, I think I've been clear. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're teasing me because mm -hmm. me and my red mangrove tirades, uh, to me, this is the best part of the episode and the most amazing oh, yeah? thing that may, besides, and we'll get to carbon sequestration because that's amazing too. But to me, this just knocked my socks off that <laughs> mangroves, 
kind of give birth to baby mangroves? I think the only reason you want to qualify it with kind of is because our mind rails against accepting (laughs) (laughs) that that's what's going on. But that is what's going on for all intents and purposes, that some mangroves are viviparous, meaning that it means um, live bearing, to where they have seeds on their on their uh, plants that they develop. They're about acorn-sized. But then rather than the seed falling off and dispersing and then eventually growing into a seedling, something much more mind-blowing happens with mangroves. That's right. Uh, the seedling is actually produced on the tree itself. Mm-hmm. And they uh, they sort of not sort of I keep qualifying it. They self plant themselves. Yeah. Uh, eventually, this thing is going to fall off. You've got to look up the video on the internet. There are many out there where it shows these you know acorn like things. They grow down to these sort of long arrow like you know green arrows that are pointing down, mm-hmm. and eventually they just go boop and they snap off and they go straight down. And they either stick into the ground at low tide or I saw them in two feet of ocean water just going straight through and sticking into the sand. And they plant themselves. They do. They they plant themselves in that sandy bottom and then they sprout roots really fast. I saw that they can start growing roots within hours, um, which means that also if they don't fall straight down, if they fall and they land on their side, they can actually st- stand themselves up by growing roots on the ground-facing side and then grow roots on the other side as well, which is pretty amazing. But what's even more amazing is that if they, they fall, they happen to fall at like high tide and it's pretty deep and they never touch the bottom in any way, they'll float along. They'll go out to sea. And as they're out to sea, they're a little tree growing like growing leaves, getting water um, from the the ocean and doing photosynthesis in the sunlight. And they can float around for up to a year before they make land and stand themselves up and grow roots wherever they land. (laughs) It's just unbelievable because this was an evolutionary adaptation. uh, Because my first thought was, well, why why doesn't the acorn-like seed just fall into the water and float around? But it must have just not been able to survive and got waterlogged and died mm-hmm. and and adapted to grow on the tree itself and get that little seedling started. Yeah, because think about this, Chuck. A seedling is a small, viable tree. All, it has everything it needs to grow. So it's an individual organism. And when the um, the 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 mangrove is growing the seedling on its tree on itself, that's gestation. Because when it drops off, it's like a giraffe dropping a baby out, like three yeah. or four feet above <laughs> above the ground. <laughs> yeah. It's the same thing. It's gestation. It's a live birth of a plant. It's nuts, man. I love it. And the baby giraffe uh, sticks its nose into the ground and, is, <laughs> and, and grows from there for months yep. and months. Plants some roots out of its head, and there you go. Uh, well, let's talk about the mangals a little bit. We've talked about um, the fact that uh, these forests are very dense, but it is a... a a dense ecosystem that is dense in more ways than one. It's not just all these gnarly roots that you see everywhere. There are all kinds of fish habitats and wildlife habitats that exist in these mangals. Yeah, one of the reason why these like um, root systems and why the, the above water um, parts of the trees are all just so thick, like you were saying, it's so hard to get through, is because of the way that they drop seedlings right off of their tree yeah. right around them. So these mangals develop into these really thick deposits of trees and shrubs uh, above water and below water because they grow so closely together. And as they grow, they migrate one way or another, or they just spread out one way or another, sometimes toward the ocean, sometimes behind them, sometimes t- uh, to either side of the shore. But that's how they, they grow, and that's why they're so dense, too. Uh, and that provides a lot of protection for these habitats. Uh, there are all manner of fish. Uh, if you're in Florida, you're going to see gray snapper in there, or well, you probably won't see him. Um, snook, tarpon. Um, this is pretty remarkable. The Goliath grouper, uh, which is actually endangered, spends s- their first six years in that mangal before it goes to open water. Yeah, and it's not just like a few kinds of fish, like things like octopi, sharks, shrimp, um, mollusks, just tons of different kinds of fish 
like this is their nursery ground because these roots, these tangle of roots provide a place for juveniles to like hide out of reach of predators and get bigger and bigger because it's also a very nourishing place for them to eat too. So they're, they're really, really important as nurseries for all kinds of sea life. Yeah, and if you're talking about eating seafood, uh, the commercial fishing industry, and this just sort of uh, shows you how important these mangals are, mm-hmm. uh, a one-square-mile loss of mangrove uh, forest uh, would lose about 275,000 pounds of fish every year. Uh, and then that's not even to speak of all the indigenous communities that, um, that are, you know, rely on these fish to provide their sustenance. Right, and so that's just the below water part of the mangal. The above water part of the mangal basically does the same thing, but for terrestrial and arboreal animals like monkeys, insects, reptiles, uh, birds, they make their home and their nurseries in those um, the mangals too. The the branches, the leaves, the trunks, um, those are really just as important for above ground animals as they are for below water animals. Yeah, and you mentioned that Bengal tiger. Uh, this was also in the some Darbins, right? Yes. And this is the largest single population of Bengal tigers on planet Earth, and it's only about a hundred of them, but they live in these uh, in these mangals. Yes, and also attention, Kristen Bell. Uh, if you are ambivalent <laughs> about mangrove forests, prepare to care, because in Panama, the pygmy three-toed sloth critically endangered, by the way, only makes its home in mangrove forests down there. That's right. So you got to care now. I I, I still watch that video of her and that sloth about once every two years. (laughs) Yeah, it's It's just one of the great human reactions to something. Yeah, and I remember how heartened we were when we realized that she didn't touch it, even though she clearly wanted to more than she's ever wanted to do anything in her life, but she doesn't, (laughs) she didn't do it, you know, so good for her. It's pretty great. Uh, I think we can move on to some superpowers, right? Yeah, mangrove superpower number one, which is coastline protection, which is pretty important if you live along the coast. Yeah, this is a big one. Um, One great benefit of all those above-ground gnarly mess of roots that are everywhere is, and it just makes perfect common sense when you look at them, is Mm -hmm. they make great wave breaks. Mm -hmm. Um, Any kind of wave, even uh, like a tsunami is that a word? It is now. I think it's a great <laughs> word. <laughs> right. Tsunami's wave is going to be cut down big time when it hits this stuff. It's just going to, you know, just cut through and disperse it in a, in a really profound way. Yeah, because there's so many different, like, roots and individual things to bump into on the way to the shore that it's going to reduce its energy, um, which means that it reduces one of the uh, pernicious effects that waves have on shore, which is erosion. And not only does it reduce erosion because the waves don't have enough energy to take stuff back out to sea, it actually has them deposit the sediments that they're bringing to the shore in the mangrove swamps. And if you compare, if you combine that, I should say, with the really um, low oxygen um, uh, environments that make up the mucky bottom in a mangrove mangal, um, you, if, I guess you can kind of flash back to our coal, the mystery of coal episode where we talked a yeah. lot about how swamps work like that. So mangrove uh, swamps are very much like that as well. But then in addition to that, they have um, ocean sediments being brought, all this organic stuff being brought from the oceans, layering with the, the mucky sediment that um, from the mangroves falling into the muck, um, which means that they're like holding on to a lot of stuff and building up soil as a matter of fact, so much so that they it outpaces sea level rises in some areas. Yeah, I mean, th- this kind of falls under one of their other superpowers is the fact that they are literally sequestering carbon. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think that they they add about, and w- we'll get to that in more detail in a minute, but um, in Australia, some mangrove or some mangals in Australia and Belize add about 10 millimeters or more of coastal soil each year. A um, hundredth which, of a meter. Yeah, I mean, that doesn't sound like that much, but a uh, sea level rise is coming in at about 3.2 meters a year. So in parts of Australia and Belize, it is actually outpacing climate change. 
Yeah, that's pretty cool. And that's really, really important because the sea levels rise. If the soil level is rising, we don't have to worry quite as much about sea level rise there. But that's only in some spots, as we'll see. Yeah, and uh, as far as the waves go, uh, and we're talking about tsunamis, um, well, with just regular waves, for every 100 meters of a mangrove forest that a wave will hit, mm -hmm. uh, its height can decrease by as much as 66%. Wow. Uh, and if you're looking at um, storm surges, which is, you know, one of the big dangers, it's not just the wave, it's that, that water surge, if you listen to our tsunami episode. Uh, there was a study that found that storm, uh, surge depths um, were reduced about a f little over a foot and a half for every little more than a half a mile, uh, 50 centimeters over every kilometer. Yeah. And that doesn't sound like a ton, but... If you've got a mangrove forest that's, you know, several miles deep, then we're talking, you know, six or seven feet of uh, less storm surge happening. And that can make a really big difference in flooding. Oh, yeah, because the storm surge is what gets you. I mean, it, it can flood miles and miles inland. It carries all sorts of debris with it. It has so much energy. It can just rip buildings down. It's a real problem from hurricanes. It's that flooding that from the storm surge. But because those mangroves are there to absorb a bunch of that energy, it just doesn't have the opportunity to come nearly as far inland. So mangrove forests, especially thick ones, save human lives and you would guess animal lives too. Yeah, and we've seen the sort of the this bear out in very sad ways when mangrove forests have disappeared. Um, I think it was in uh, the Indo-Pacific region in the 1950s. They used to have about five miles like deep of mangrove forest. By the 1990s, they were depleted uh, because of shrimp farming. We'll talk about that later as well. But basically, you know, human caused depletion. Uh, and in 91, there was a cyclone that hit the coast of Bangladesh where there were no longer any mangrove forests to cut down on that impact. And there was no buffer and there was a big 20-foot storm surge and almost 140,000 people died. Right. I saw, I saw that um, they had – a lot of those people died because they weren't – they didn't use storm shelters – in addition to the mangrove buffer being gone, mm -hmm. and that they had built the storm shelters, Chuck, after a 1970 cyclone that killed 500,000 people <sighs> in Bangladesh. Wow. Can you believe that? Can you imagine a storm killing half a million people in your country yeah. or your little area? That's insane. It is. That's devastating. Uh, like they it's did, biblical, you know? Yeah. Uh, they did some studies, too, with... Um, the tsunami in the Indian Ocean in 2004, and they found that the the mangroves there were about 100 meters deep, and they uh, at least helped reduce those waves uh, between five and 30 percent. So that's that's a big deal, you know, six feet of storm surge, mm -hmm. up to 30 percent of wave height, and the initial um, rush in from the ocean is you're saving a lot of lives in that case. Yeah. And I mean, you saw how bad the the Indian Ocean tsunami was too. It just makes you wonder, like, how much worse it could have been without yeah. mangroves. Um, so I say we take our second break and we come back and talk about carbon sequestration. That's right, aka superpower number two. <laughs> All right, we had promise of superpower number two, and we teased a little bit early, uh, earlier I did, about carbon sequestration. Mm -hmm. uh, so we need to talk a little bit about uh, what people are calling a blue carbon ecosystem, uh, blue sort of referencing the ocean. Yeah, it's it's basically the same thing, like, you know, trees inland capturing carbon and storing them in their, their bits and parts. <laughs> this is this is just um, coastal vegetation doing the same thing. Um, and the thing is, is like trees, they're really efficient at, at capturing carbon and storing it. But because of our friends fungi and rot, um, when the tree dies, that carbon gets released back into the ecosystem and even possibly back into the atmosphere mm -hmm. if, say, like a wildfire happens. Right? Atmosphere? <laughs> <laughs> Hot wheels. <laughs> That is right. But uh, you know how we mentioned before that 
um, with that soil that uh, the water is basically the ocean water is just sitting on top of. Mm-hmm. It is not, it's just building up to that uh, salty peat. And that carbon is not being released like it does in a terrestrial forest. Yeah. And it's not breaking down. So it is a, a champion at storing carbon. Not only good at it, but really good at it. Yeah. It's like the Judah Friedlander of forests as far as carbon sequestration goes. <laughs> I'd, I love Judah Friedlander. We actually met him once, but I don't mm-hmm. get the joke. Oh, he always wore a hat that said world champion. Oh, okay. <laughs> And he was always boasting about stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. I love that guy. When we, we met him at a event with Jesse Thorne and Hodgman many years ago, mm-hmm. and this was kind of during his uh, run on... Uh, 30 Rock. 30 Rock. And this, this is when also, well, I was also wearing my Last Chance Garage hat all the time, uh, which I haven't put on in a couple of years, I hate to say so. Oh. Probably a few years. Um, but he, I remember when I met him, he went, and in that face of his, he kind of peered up at my hat and that patch, and he went... All right. Okay. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> that was a great Judah Friedland. I was like, man. hey, I got the stamp of approval from uh, the hat guy. Yeah, definitely the hat guy for sure. It was cool. So, but yeah, so mangroves are, are the champion of carbon sequestration, so much so that they are four times more efficient than terrestrial um, vegetation at storing what? carbon, which makes them like a bona fide carbon sink. Mangrove forests are. Um, and again, it's because there's just no decay. There's no fungus. There's no rot. All the stuff, that all the vegetation that dies and falls down into the muck just gets stuck there and covered over and doesn't get a chance to break down. So as long as you don't dig up or destroy a mangrove forest and cut up the peat, to use it as as cheap fuel, you've got a really good carbon sink on your hands. Yeah, to the tune of um, worldwide, uh, mangals account for about 6.4 billion tons of carbon mm-hmm. uh, that's being held in check. Uh, that means when you do do something, like you hinted at, mm-hmm. it can have devastating effects for the world. Surprise, surprise. Uh, if you cut down a mangrove forest, that carbon is going to be released. Uh, that sequestered carbon is slowly going to creep back into the atmosphere uh, from 2000 to 2015, um, roughly 122 million tons of carbon, uh, extra carbon were released into the atmosphere because of the destruction of mangrove forests. And uh, between 80 and 2000, 30% of the mangals of the world have been stripped away and it it is outpacing like the tropical rainforest uh, destruction. That's mind-boggling because if you just hear the figures on how how frequently and how much rainforest is cut down, the idea that mangrove forest is outpacing it is pretty nuts. <clears throat> but apparently, um, Myanmar is the is the current hotspot for mangrove deforestation. Between 1996 and 2016, Myanmar cut down 60 percent of its mangals. Ugh. Just gone. And part of the problem is, is like you can restore mangrove forests, fortunately. We'll talk about some people who do that, but it can take a while. And sometimes when you restore some mangroves, you put the seedlings in and uh, a typhoon or a cyclone or a hurricane comes along and just washes them all away. So if your timing's wrong, uh, it might take a very long time for you to restore a mangrove forest. So it's just not something you want to cut down willy nilly, basically. No, um, shrimp farming is something we mentioned earlier in passing, but they are the the biggest culprit, uh, mm-hmm. responsible for thirty five percent of mangrove uh, forest loss. And you know, people love shrimp all around the world and in Thailand oh, yes. in the eighties and nineties, um, and and other places as well. But especially Thailand, uh, they cut down a lot of mangrove forests to make these sh- uh, shrimp farms along the coastline. Uh, and then you've also got the sea level rise that's. Uh, causing destruction. We mentioned uh, parts of Australian Belize that those um, soil deposits are outpacing it, but mm-hmm. that's only in a couple of those places. It is it is not doing that in other areas. No. Um, so that means that sea level rise is outpacing soil deposition there. Um, I want to say one more thing about shrimp farming, too. I looked a little bit into it, and I cannot decide... Maybe it deserves its own episode. Who knows? Oh, okay. One of the other problems with shrimp farming, in addition to um, a shrimp farm sharing the same kind of land or a mangrove forest that land it occupies being desirable for a shrimp farm, so you cut down mangrove forests to build a shrimp farm, is that 
when you harvest shrimp, you basically have to refresh the water. So shrimp farmers typically just basically open a dam and let all the water out. Mm -hmm. And that water is filled with tons of nutrients that overwhelm the carrying capacity of the the ecosystems, the mangrove forests around the shrimp farm. And uh, you get what's called an algae bloom, which sucks up all the oxygen, kills off all the fish, and has just this devastating effect on the ecosystem surrounding it. So shrimp farming is really hard on the areas where it, it takes place, not just from the shrimp farms themselves, but from what comes out of the shrimp farms as well. And there's just so many basic good best practices that could be followed that yeah. just aren't followed that there's almost like a general like duh coming out of the shrimp farming <laughs> industry as far as I can tell that really needs to be fixed. It's almost as if they just want to continue to make as much money as they can before right. they're regulated in some way. But, I mean, what are you going to do if you tried to regulate them at all? You've got a nanny state on your hands, and who wants that? Yeah, and it, shrimp farming is just one tiny fraction of uh, the great amounts of harm that are happening uh, to the ocean because of uh, lots of things. But commercial fishing is, is certainly one of them. I will say, though, it's really hard to turn down shrimp on pizza. Uh, <laughs> is that, that your thing or something? <laughs> no, no, that's that was from years back. I used to love shrimp on pizza. Uh, all right, talk to me more about this. What 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 are we talking? You just throw some shrimp on a regular cheese, or is it like a, a barbecue pineapple thing? No, or no, 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 a regular pizza. But you don't want to use just any shrimp. You certainly don't want to use jumbo shrimp. You want to use the little tiny salad shrimp because they cook just enough. With the pizza, a bigger shrimp might still be partially raw. It's going to be too big to eat. Oh, you, you put it on there raw? Those, yeah, you just throw some oh, of those. Okay. Well, no, I think they usually come already cooked now that I think about it. But you just throw a couple handfuls on your pizza, <laughs> put it in the oven, and there you, thank me later, basically. Oh, man, I love shrimp. I don't know about shrimp and pizza. Well, now I feel bad about eating shrimp knowing how bad shrimp farming is. I know. It, it's, uh, yeah, it's another wake-up call, isn't it? Well, yes, and I've been awoken because I'm now farming my own shrimp here at home in a very sustainable <laughs> manner so that I can have it on my pizza. Ah, bathtub shrimp. <laughs> That's right. It's delicious. We don't take baths anyway. Yeah. Yumi's like, why do you have an out-of-order sign on our bathroom door? Right. I'm still trying to figure out how to break the news to Yumi. <laughs> we don't really have a working bathtub anymore. Uh, so... There are also invasive species that can uh, totally wreck the health of a man gall uh, in the 70s in China. Uh, they were trying to do the right thing, I think. There were conservationists that um, transplanted some marsh grasses that were from the United States there to try and slow erosion, but it crowded out mangroves. Uh, and then in Texas, they weren't trying to do the right thing. Um, they, The fish and game officials there, um, they said, hey, people like hunting this uh, exotic Asian antelope, it's called uh, a nilgai, I guess, N-I-L-G-A-I. Mm -hmm. So let's put them in Texas so people can hunt them. Um, and it turns out they love to eat mangroves. Yeah. So the, they're being deforested by the game that was imported to Texas to hunt, which means I'm sure there's huge bounties on these things now, too. Yeah. Isn't that funny how that all works out? So there are people who are like, we really need to, to work on this. We need to get mangroves back. Um, and there are places where, this is the good news, mangrove deforestation, globally speaking, on average, has actually stopped progressing and is now starting to decline. Yeah. The deforestation is. That's so great. people are, are, you know, kind of getting hip to the idea that we really need these things. They provide... It, it, countless services for us humans. So even the most selfish human can get behind mangrove restoration, right? Yeah. I mean, I think there's about 42% of the worldwide mangals are protected now. But yeah. you, you need that number at like 92, well, at 100. But I would feel much better if it was like in the 80s or 90s, you know? Yeah, and not only that, like like areas that have been developed coastally need to replant the mangroves that they cut down to to um, to build because they need them really bad. You, you need mangrove buffers, as we've found. Whatever you can get is helpful. That's right. Uh, but there's another kind of clever financial instrument, as they call it, uh, called blue bonds. It mm -hmm. is a subset of green bonds. Uh, green bonds came around a, a while ago, and these are basically – if you have money and you want to invest uh, responsibly, 
um, in a way that uh, not only doesn't impact the environment but can help the environment. You invest in a green bond or if you're really into the ocean, the subset of blue bonds, which were first introduced in 2018. Right. And so if, if like you want to offset your emissions, you buy a blue bond and all of a sudden you've just paid somebody to go plant some mango or not mango, maybe mango too, but mangrove <laughs> forests. Right. Yeah. A mango forest. That sounds delicious. <laughs> it would be. I'd be like plant it in my backyard. That's where I want uh, you to plant it with my yeah. blue bond. So look into blue bonds and green bonds. It's, um, I saw something depressing the other day when they were, I don't know what they were talking about on the news, but they basically said, like, if you have an IRA, like, <laughs> you are supporting all kinds of companies that you would probably never support in real life. Oh, yeah, definitely. Mutual funds. Yeah, mutual funds. Just everything's all lumped in. So mm -hmm. they were trying to encourage people, to, if they're able to, to be a little more selective in, in what they choose to invest in. Well, there's a lot of sustainable mutual funds, too. That's right. Um, that where they're, you know, very carefully selected. Unfortunately, that means the um, management fee is going to be higher. But if you care... It doesn't really matter, you know. Oh, is it really uh, a higher management fee? Yeah, anytime it requires any additional thought or effort, the management fee just <laughs> automatically goes up. I had to click on three extra things. <laughs> right. I had to find out what these blue bonds were. That's my impression <sighs> of a mutual fund manager. <laughs> yeah, financial advisor. If that's your yeah. financial advisor, you're going to the wrong person. <laughs> right. I meet him at Burger King every couple of weeks. <laughs> In the back. Yeah, where else would you meet? Um, you got anything else? You got nothing else. Up with mangroves. Up with mangroves. Uh, and since we both said up with mangroves, everybody, that means it's time for listener mail. Uh, this is a thank you from a Satanist. Uh, we had a great podcast that we must have uh, put this on a select recently, I guess. Yeah, like two weeks ago. Okay. Uh, hey, guys, discovered your podcast uh, in 2011, have been hooked ever since. Your informative banter-filled episodes remained a welcome constant in my life throughout college, adult years, and now parenthood. It oh, was yeah. helping me stay sane during sleepless nights with my newborns. Uh, when I saw the episode on Satanism, I guess I hadn't listened to it previously, um, I was simultaneously excited and nervous. I would uh, hope you'd give it the usual Josh and Chuck treatment, and I was not disappointed. Uh, over the years, I've been given a lot of grief being a Satanist. Uh, people often assume that I'm a very devout Christian based on the way I look, and often go from praising me to threatening my family upon learning that I follow the tenets set forth by the Satanic Temple. Hmm. Uh, by shedding some light on the true nature of Satanism, I feel that you have given many people a look into the practice in a non-threatening way, and hopefully this will help people choose kindness over fear-based hatred when interacting with Satanists in the future. Mm -hmm. And thank you for being bold enough to put this episode out in the world. I'm sure it wasn't that easy, uh, but this longtime listener appreciates it. Your friendly Satanist, Donna. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Donna. Donna the Satanist. Um, yeah, that was uh, that was a good one because you know, I went back and listened to it to QA it before it was a select. I was like, this was a really good episode. Yeah. But there was one thing at the beginning, Chuck, that now I wish we had back mm -hmm. um, because a couple of people wrote in, and it was that we we see a wait at the beginning saying like if you're you know yeah. a Christian you probably don't want to listen to this, and people wrote in and said no, like you you should not have said that because there's plenty of people out there who should hear this and. Yeah. You know, right. change their views on people who hold these views. So um, if you go back and listen to that, just plug your ears for that first part and then listen to it through again. Yeah, that was 40-year-old Chuck talking. <laughs> right. Not 51-year-old not Chuck. That's right. That's right. Ooh, that's a weird number to say. It is, Chuck. 51 is a weird number, and it's going to be a weird <laughs> time in your life. I'm sure of it. <laughs> Jerk. <laughs> Uh, that's that, it, huh? That's what I think I'll always hate is you'll always be younger than me. No matter how much I want you to speed up that's the aging right. process, you'll always you, be younger. You would have to travel to Mars in suspended animation, and I, I might would just, just have to do stay that. here on Earth <laughs> for, for me to catch up. All right. I'm going to look into that. Uh, thanks a lot, Donna. We appreciate that big time. And if you want to be like Donna and send us some kudos, we'll take them. You can send it in an email to stuffpodcast at iheartradio.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.